Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. I'm really excited today to have a, a, a wonderful panel. Um, as you guys know, the mission of Cello is creating prosperity for all. Uh, and now I'd love to introduce our panelists who are actually um, putting that mission to work with really interesting use cases for Cello technology in their respective markets. Um, so the way this will work is I will uh, hand it over to our panelists to introduce themselves and then we'll do a round of lightning talks where they'll talk about the work that they're doing and how they're using Cello and uh, blockchain technology to really advance the mission and create more financial inclusion. And then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, so without further ado, um, Ken, why don't you take it away? Hey, I'm Ken. I'm from Mercy Corps Ventures. So we are the impact investing arm of the uh, international NGO Mercy Corps. Uh, our investment team, we focus on financial resilience and climate resilience, and we've been running crypto pilots for the last two years uh, at the intersection of emerging markets and financial inclusion. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Or in Filipino, we say magandang hapon. Uh, my name is Christine Violago. I am the country manager of Grameen Foundation in the Philippines. So we are an international nonprofit, and we work with fintechs, um, private sector, and even other social nonprofits to test solutions on the ground for financial inclusion initiatives for women groups and smallholder farmers. So Cello is actually one of our um, partners in the Philippines for three projects already, and we're looking forward to share one today about the social dividend campaign. Hello everyone, my name is Elisa Molena. I work for the World Food Program and I run an initiative called Impact that aims at connecting vulnerable population to the digital economy through digital skills training and connecting uh, the trainees to um, income generating opportunities online and offline. Um, we are running currently a project in Kenya um, so unbanked and underbanked population can earn a stable coin and uh, while working online and earning, and earning an income. Thank you. Great, great. So without further ado, why don't I turn it over to Ken, who will talk a bit more about his program. Cool. All right. Um, so I'm here to talk about the work that we've been doing, uh, crypto pilots for financial inclusion in emerging markets. Uh, so broadly speaking, and I think like the message that's been echoing around the past few days here, we all believe, and that's I think why we're all here, that cryptocurrencies and blockchain technologies, they have the power to include the 1.7 billion people in the world who are un or underbanked. And I think in order to do this, in order to influence policymakers to shape the narratives, we need to build the body of evidence around how crypto can actually be used for good. Right? How do we actually demonstrate that these powerful technologies can be deployed in a way that's responsible and actually bringing people who are otherwise unserved into the, into the wider landscape here. And the way that we are doing this is by launching these pilots. And we've been running pilots for the past two years, focused on crypto, focused on driving financial inclusion in emerging markets. Now, I'll just share a very quick summary of some of the pilots that we've been doing. So in the past year and a half or so, we've completed four. Uh, the first one is a cross-border stablecoin payment for digital workers in Kenya. Uh, this was something that we did with Celo, with Appen, uh, Corsali, Kotani Pay, and, uh, and there's been a white paper and some policy recommendations that have come out of that recently. Uh, we also ran something around smart contract weather insurance in Kenya. So this was converting uh, uh, parametric insurance products into smart contracts. So the, pa the pain point here is that in Sub-Saharan Africa, only 3% of smallholder farmers actually purchase crop insurance. The reason why it's only 3% is because the process sucks. If you are buying a policy, and then let's say the event gets triggered that you're, you're insuring, it can take weeks, months, maybe even years for you to receive your payment. Chances are you're not going to buy that product if that was available for you here. Now, by putting these onto smart contracts, you can make everything instantaneous, instantaneous and also transparent. So as a smallholder farmer, you can therefore say, all right, well, has there been sufficient rainfall in my plot of land? If there is, then instantaneously, there will be a deposit made into your M-Pesa account. And this therefore makes the process a lot simpler, uh, a lot faster, and also cheaper so that there's a, a higher return to the farmer at the end of the day. Something that we ran with Acre Africa, Etherisk, uh, and the Mercy Corps team in Kenya. We also ran something in Rwanda, which was around uh, DeFi savings incentives for informal merchants. This is something that was launched on um, using a Terra wallet with Soka Watch. 
uh, and based on UST. So just giving uh, DeFi savings incentives towards micro, micro uh, MSMEs. Uh, and lastly, we ran something in Colombia. So this was supporting Venezuelan migrants who had fled uh, the hyperinflationary environment, the despotic regime in Venezuela. They'd made their way across the border into Colombia. Mercy Corps Colombia had been supporting them. And we were providing uh, additional cash support through um, a digital wallet. And this was a stablecoin asset that they could then send back home to their family and friends in Venezuela. And so, of course, being US dollar peg, this is a nice hedge against inflation. And then because it's all digital, it's, it's of course, easy to transmit. And then there's an off-ramp directly into the banks in Venezuela, so you're able to help, help um, the family and friends back home quite simply. Uh, so those are the pilots that we ran uh, in the past year and a half. We have a few in the pipeline right now. We're running something with uh, Celo in Kenya around a DeFi lending product with Moolah Market. Uh, very excited about that one. There's something that we're going to deploy in Cameroon around DeFi savings. So taking uh, the pain point here is that uh, you know if you are a average Joe in Cameroon, you typically don't have access to high yielding savings products. Now the the closest analog that's out there is a government bond, but in order to buy a government bond, the minimum ticket price to entry is around 1 million uh, West African francs, which is around $1,800. So you probably don't want to park that much money. You probably don't have that much money lying around to actually buy this. Uh, and so what, what we're able to do now is fractionalize these bonds and tokenize them all on a blockchain so that instead of paying $1,800, you can pay $1 or $2 and then just deposit what you have available and receive the commensurate around amount of yield uh, and coupon payment from that. Uh, all again, thanks to the power of the blockchain. Uh, so these are things that are in our pipeline and things that we're going to be launching soon. And that leads to this other announcement that we made a few weeks ago, which was around a larger, broader piloting vehicle. So we're calling all startups who are working on piloting technologies, or sorry, who are piloting blockchain and crypto technologies in emerging markets at the intersection of uh, financial inclusion and also broader into like the refi space as well. We're availing up to a million dollars, uh, up to 10 startups can apply and get access to this. Uh, we'll also provide some coaching, introduction to the network and our ecosystem from our investments, uh, investment side, excuse me, and then also supporting on the uh, impact metrics and brand exposure to the Mercy Corps audience. Uh, so we encourage all of you to look and apply. Uh, happy to take any questions about that later as well. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Ken. It's amazing to see all the pilot work that Mercy Corps is doing, and it's exciting that you guys are putting more money where uh, your mouth is by funding a lot of these startups and innovation in emerging markets. Um, so, Christine, why don't you talk a little bit more about Grameen and what you're doing with um, blockchain technology? Sure, thank you, Will. Um, so today I'd like to share a story of how we use blockchain to build a community-based entrepreneurial ecosystem in the Philippines. And we call it the Social Dividend Campaign. So in 2020, we actually started to work with Celo to provide immediate relief efforts in um, Metro Manila and Cebu by creating a microsite and testing out cryptocurrency in Valora so that we could provide immediate relief efforts of grocery items, hygiene kits, and medicines to 3,500 micro-entrepreneurs. So we did this through the support of C-Labs and the Cello Alliance of Prosperity members in trying to understand what are the pain points for these women micro-entrepreneurs, and that is not being able to leave their house because of the lockdowns and having to queue or go to centers with probably a lot of populations just looking for help. And so by delivering a safe and remote way of assistance in a very efficient manner, because the, the wave of release of uh, funds to these micro-entrepreneurs was very fast. It was also very transparent because we were able to identify who would need the benefit or who would need the support the most. But we realized, even if it is a critical moment of providing um, relief efforts, sometimes there are ways that can be um, more sustainable. And so what was up next? We wanted to create a, a support or initiative that would be more long-term and serving a population in the Philippines that was affected negatively by also the COVID-19. And so we targeted, at this case, overseas Filipino workers who were repatriated and lost their jobs, 
particularly those families who were very much reliant on international remittance or support from their families abroad. So we wanted to create a system wherein the CUSD that they would receive would be um, support for capital and then transact with different types of merchants within the community. So how does this work? It's very, in a way, we thought it would be simple, but honestly, it is a very complex system that we look, work closely with two local partners on the ground. The first one is Atika, which is an overseas workers um, community initiative that help identify the beneficiaries and Echo Life, which is like a marketing cooperative that supported the creation of um, Echo Life hubs or the business hubs. So what we did in Grameen is identify first the beneficiaries and then um, they received 200 CUSD and then they would actually purchase raw materials from the hubs, create the products and services and then sell it back to the cooperative for a larger market. So we tried to push a circulation within these different types of merchants. Um, and so they have interaction in a physical place, but also have coaching and guidance from the partners themselves on sustainability efforts and social support so that they could understand how can we market our products better. And more importantly, how can the features of the app um, and peer-to-peer -peer transactions be beneficial for their um, Echo Life Hub or the business hub. So in trying to push for these circulations, we realized these efforts are um, an investment also of time of our partners because it's not easy to introduce a system or a technology in a community that does not have even access to an e-money wallet. So how does that work? First is creating the promotion of the project. And second is building trust on the system. And third would be creating an infrastructure that works um, so that people will have um, a very seamless um, experience through your platform. So what were the benefits of this? Actually, for the cooperative, it increased the number of membership to 300%. Um, it also actually started to give an opportunity for them to open up their ideas on cryptocurrency and digital, digitize some of their operations and accounting systems. So aside from crypto, what else can we digitize within the orgs? Um, it also changed the habit of some of the beneficiaries and savings realized when they saw the Valora platform and they saw Supercharge, instead of taking out the full money in their wallet, they're like, oh, I can earn something here. So they leave their money there for the first time. And eventually, by the end of the program, when we went back to ask them, um, what did you, do you think you're more reliant before you began this project with us? They say yes. They're more food secure. And second, some of them reported that they started to begin to save for the first time. Because in the Philippines, sometimes um, when they have a digital wallet, like an ATM or even a money wallet, because of the emerging needs of their household, sometimes they just zero out the wallet. But in this case, there are people reporting that they're starting to save because of those features. And I think this also allows us to establish a good merchant case for the um, hubs because now there's a lot of um, interactions between the members and the Echo Hub manager, managers that are using the cryptocurrency. So these are just some of our um, stories from our beneficiaries. So just to reiterate what makes it work, it's really having to support and build the capacity of our partners on the ground through community agents. Make sure that your innovate innovative tools and digital tools are um, going to really affect and understand the behavior of spending of our different um, partners and beneficiaries because it's easy to lose their trust. One mistake or one failure or, or they sometimes feel that, oh no, I don't want to be, I don't want to experience a scam. And I think if they learn from experience or learn from doing or making a transaction, you're already one step closer to building the trust. And lastly is creating a physical infrastructure for economic activity. Because your best marketing effort or tool is actually word of mouth from good experience of your beneficiaries. So if you have a good tool, you have a good experience, it will spread first in your household 
and eventually in the community and the members within your cooperative. And that social support will be there for you. So to end, I know I'm almost at time. Um, I just want to say that there are a lot of ideas out there. And I think it's a matter of looking for a partner. Like Ramin Foundation, we're always looking for partnerships that can test your solutions and bring it closer to the people who need it the most. And I hope that it's it's, this experience or story inspires you to come also to Asia and the Philippines to explore other efforts like for agriculture and, and financial inclusion efforts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. Uh, so, what I love about that is the evolution of our work with the Grameen Foundation. The first, I think Grameen Foundation was the first NGO pilot we did, and we wanted to prove out the use case that you could deliver aid more cheaply, transparently, and efficiently. And as these pilots evolved, we started looking at other ways to bring more tools into financial inclusion. So I appreciate that. Um, so now, Elisa, we have a, a long relationship with the World Food Program. I feel like we met three years ago and have been trying to get work up um, for a long time. And so, uh, yeah, why don't we talk a little bit about what we've done? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, it was a long relationship, long in the making, but we eventually made it. Uh, made, made it. Made it happen. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so as I told you before, I'm the global lead of this initiative called Impact. And the whole point of the project is to bridge the gap between a vulnerable population, I mean, the guys here have already covered that um, at extent, in the digital economy. So um, we have around 800 million food insecure people in the world, and unfortunately, the number is increasing. Uh, but at the same time, there is also a booming digital economy COVID clearly um, was, uh, was very problematic for our operations, but for my project specifically, um, made it a bit easier um, to actually make company, com convince companies that they can hire and find talent in the most unexpected places. So um, making remote um, and online work happen um, was, was actually something that COVID uh, helped a lot with. So um, the way the, the, model, the model works is we do global sourcing. So we talk with companies, we talk with uh, micro work platforms, we, call, we talk with the freelancing platform, uh, the Fiverr, the Upworks, right? And uh, we try to identify what are the needs in the global labor market. And we understand these needs and they understand the needs of the companies, and then we create tailored trainings um, that we, you know, um, uh, we then um, implement in a variety of countries where WFP is present. And our target group are young people, um, host communities, refugees, displaced people. Um, we have a minimum of 50% of uh, female participation, so we really push for also women um, uh, learning digital skills. And then after the training is done, we bring back the talents to our uh, sourcing partners. And, um, and the whole point is that they are hired and can earn an income. So um, the point of using crypto uh, was that a lot of our participants were unbanked and underbanked, so they could be trained, we could find a position for them somewhere, but then eventually they couldn't withdraw the money they were earning. So um, we understood that um, crypto and stable coins were an amazing opportunity uh, to really include this Huge, huge amount of people that were excluded um, uh, from uh, financial services. And we ran the po uh, pilot in Kenya at the end of last year, and now the idea is that we expand this pilot further. So as you can see here in the slide, the, the dark blue countries are the countries in which we are currently operating, um, and the light blue countries are the countries in which I'm trying to expand. So um, Kenya, it's an easy, country, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a very good sandbox where to try the solutions because we have very good safety nets if something doesn't work out. But, you know, I'm trying to find solutions for Yemen, for Afghanistan, and there we need to really make sure that if we bring an innovation, it works immediately. People are extremely vulnerable. We don't want them to feel like they're guinea pigs, right? So, um, uh, as Christina said before, if you have any idea, if you have any solution, 
come uh, come to us at the end of this uh, of this panel because we are really here to hear from from all of you how to make to make this work and um, Yes, so this is one of our asks. The second ask is, if you know companies that are looking for talents, uh, please reach out because um, we really have so many super qualified people that are looking for opportunities to shine, right? Um, they might be based in a refugee camp in Iraq, or they might be based in a small, rural, um, small city in rural Colombia, but uh, they can really bring a lot on the table. And, uh, and also, we always look for funds, right? Uh, during this event, uh, people know that, that I come from the UN. They think that we have a lot of money to do this project. But I think that uh, you all know that uh, that's not really the true, right, Celo? So um, if you know about opportunities to actually expand this further, you have seen the countries where we are going to be, uh, please reach out as well. And um, yes, and let's brainstorm and let's really scale this, uh, this solution to more and more countries. Thanks. Amazing, amazing. Really inspiring work. Um, I want to kick it off with one question for our panelists, but then open it up to the audience. So if you guys have a question, please queue it up. Um, but you know, we, a lot of folks in the Web3 space talk about financial inclusion and talk about building for the unbanked and the underbanked. So I want to ask a sort of a spicy question. Um, so, uh, and we don't have a ton of time, so maybe keep it a little bit short. But what are the biggest mistakes people make when building for these populations, and what advice would you give for builders like um, the, those in the audience today to avoid those mistakes? Um, Ken, why don't we start with you? Uh, spicy, yeah. Um, so I think, I think one thing that comes to mind is that um, often the technologies and the products are already there in, in like a mature enough state. And I think it's more around the implementation that is the bigger bottleneck here, right? So I think the, the approach should be to identify the right partnerships. Um, so we're not saying like, all right, I, I don't think we need to necessarily reinvent any new wheel or anything like that. It's really, let's take these products, let's figure out like which ones of these we can actually apply and then figure out who's actually able to get out to the last mile, who's able to implement and who's actually able to you know, get these into the hands of the people who need it. Um, so I think that would probably be the, the general thing. Uh, I think on the spicier side, I would say um, when, when you're building, and to all the, the genius builders out there who are building some really, really cool stuff, um, I think, you know, you probably don't necessarily see the final financial opportunity uh, that's, that's available there. But I do think that there is a massive human opportunity to serve, and I, I would uh, I would encourage more efforts to be focused around those more human problems rather than maybe the more arcane financial derivative products that are perhaps intellectually stimulating in some way, but not necessarily rewarding from a humani humanistic perspective. Thank you, Ken. That's a great answer. Um, Christine, what about you? What advice would you have for folks who are looking to serve underbanked and uh, financially excluded populations? I think it's also said by a lot of other speakers, but I just want to reiterate it that it's always important to listen to the people on the ground on what their pain points are and challenges because it's, it, um, when you have a tool and you're introducing it in the implementation, there's going to be multiple iterations on how you in, it would introduce it, how you would train them, um, in our case, for example, we thought, okay, maybe it's enough that we train these people on how to download the application online. But we realize it's not enough. It's more than just one Zoom call. It's actually having to go to the house of that individual to handhold that particular um, piece with them and then coach them in person. And that is a time investment, which other people re don't realize it's very important as well for something um, complex to, or something that is new to them to introduce. Um, aside from listening, um, pilots also take time, but, at the, at, but we also want to feel that by the end of the project, um, it's not just Grameen that's learning, but it's also everybody in the community. So we try to leave them with materials and resources that they could share. And sometimes English is not the, the main language, so we also try to invest on making it local 
trying to put materials that are um, easily understood by the community. I think that's a great point that you mentioned, Christine. You don't ever want to leave a population worse off after you leave a pilot. And that's a mistake that people often make, where they ghost and people are like, what was the point of all this, right? And so there should be some intentionality thereafter. Um, Elisa, do you have thoughts on this question? That um, they said it all, but um, something else that we've been discussing in the past two days with a lot of the people in the audience um, is also that there are a lot of ready solutions, right, that have been tested in European, in Europe or in the US that have worked very well, but clearly, um, a lot, a lot of um, uh, user research needs to be done for the population that we serve, because for the UN, for example, for WFP, we don't only serve population in, um, um, in you know, countries where you wouldn't be usually, but we serve vulnerable population in those countries. So on top of you know having maybe challenges with infrastructures, um, there is a, a, another layer of vulnerability, which is the poverty, or that that needs to be taken absolutely into account. So really bring a lot of emotional intelligence when developing and designing any kind of intervention. Very well said. Very well said. Um, now I want to give an opportunity to the audience. Are there any questions for our panelists? Thank you. Um, so in a lot of these pilots and projects, I think like the education part is super important and you touched on that a bit, Christine. And I'm curious, how do you, can you handle that by using like incentivized local networks? to educate the people, or like, do you use the local people in a way in that? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so um, to answer, sorry, what's your name? Bogdan. Bo Bogda? Um, so yes, to answer the question, yes. So usually what we do is we train the leadership or the organization heads, and they also select key people within the organization. So it's like a training of trainers method. Um, and that's some technical assistance that we're providing to them. So aside from leaving them information on how to cascade uh, on downloading the app, it's also trying to make these people realize how important the project is. Because if they cannot internalize the impact themselves, they will not communicate it well to the beneficiaries that we support. Um, and aside from training of trainers, sometimes we also provide them um, other information outside of the project, social support, um, how to improve your mental ability um, in time of COVID, COVID. So financial services is one, training is another, and what are their um, issues within the organization that we can provide technical assistance to? Great, great. Other question? Anka? Thank you. Um, I was wondering, Elisa, if you can talk a little bit about the WFP Innovation Accelerator and the ways that uh, companies in the solo ecosystem can um, get involved. Thank nice you. plug. <laughs> so, I promise we did not plant that question, absolutely. but it's a good question. Absolutely. So, yes, so I actually started at the Innovation Accelerator of WFP three years ago, and um, it's, it's, a, it's a super cool team based in Munich. What we do is we source ideas outside and inside WFP uh, from a variety of topics. It can be food-related, it can also not be food-related, and um, what we do is um, we, when, if we select the ideas, we go through a one-week bootcamp together with the team, with teams in, uh, in WFP to understand how to pilot this idea within the UN system, within the operations WFP, and see whether it would stick and it would work out. So my project, Impact, was born out of the accelerator five years ago, and now is part of the corporate WFP uh, operation. So it graduated outside of, of the accelerator, and that's why I'm based in HQ. So um, apply, like visit the WFP Innovation Accelerator website. We have three or four innovation challenges per year. So apply, and, um, and let's see whether we can work on challenges together, right? And just one more plug for the accelerator. Cello was actually a graduate of the Innovation Accelerator, and look where we are today. So. Um, and that's why we met. That's where we met. Um, cool. If you could advance the last slide, Elisa, I just want to have one more announcement for this panel. Um, 
Um, so in the spirit of innovation, uh, I'm really excited to announce that we are launching a scholarship program to give funds to students who are doing research, academic research in blockchain and technology. So applications will open in May. Um, Angelo, uh, if he's here today, is the person who is launching that, and so please go talk to him. Um, but more information to come. But uh, I just want to say thank you so much to our panelists. Um, you guys are doing amazing work and really advancing the mission of prosperity for all. Um, so thank you. Thank you too.